thanks very much everybody for coming today and thanks Sophie for the nice introduction. Uh, this is a bit of a daunting task to talk about treating MS throughout the entire lifetime of somebody, but I'm gonna try and compress it and um, hopefully it will be uh, useful for everybody. Uh, and these are my disclosures. And uh, you've, if you've come to these in the past, you know that we've been using this uh, tagline for quite some time. That is that we are, our goal of MS therapy is lifelong brain, and I would say spine health as well. And it really gets at the idea that this is a, um, a condition that we're gonna live with for a while, and things may change over the course of the lifetime with someone with MS. And then certainly our approaches to treatment would change as well. And there can be pathological changes, clinical changes, radiologic changes, changes in biomarkers, and most importantly with treatment. But today we're gonna to focus really on immunotherapy. And uh, when I use the term DMT, those are for disease modifying therapies. And that's the focus of today and how we might use those at different times of someone's uh, career with MS. And a lot of that is gonna be based on uh, basic pathogenesis. That is how does the disease get caused pathologically? And, and we can really think of MS in, in two very broad ways as both an inflammatory condition and a neurodegenerative condition. And they're really tightly linked with one another. But the types of inflammation that we see over the course of time is very variable. There's two parts in a broad sense of the immune system, what we call the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. And they're differentially active at different points of this uh, autoimmune condition in terms of uh, the, the timing with age. And when people are younger, they will have what we call adaptive immune system dysfunction. These are the white blood cells that we talk about a lot, the T cells, the B cells, but also macrophages and, and a variety of other parts of the immune system. And they cause these acute lesions clinically, but also these acute attacks clinically with relapses followed by remissions and very active lesions on scans. These are very important early, especially in younger patients. But then as people get older, that gets less and less important. What becomes more important is the innate immune system. The innate immune system is that part of the immune system that doesn't really learn. The T cells and B cells learn and will react to viruses and bacteria and other things like that. But the innate immune system is that which is in fact present already inside the brain and the spinal cord. And these, especially microglia are very active very early in the course of the illness, but over time become more and more important. And we have what's called compartmentalized inflammation, especially focused on the innate immune system and it's a different kind of inflammation. And the important point is that not all of the medications will be able to actually be effective in both. In fact, really, the medicines themselves are much more effective against the adaptive immune system, which is uh, present very early in the process with MS. So this is an important distinction, but they're both types of inflammation and they're both important. And so uh, many of you have also seen this. Uh, this is our little cartoon showing us all of the different types of medications that have been approved since 1993 after beta serin was approved then, including the most recent one uh, on the far right, Burimvi in yellow there. A number of studies uh, that uh, Dr. Wolf will be talking about will be, uh, uh, for example, the BTK inhibitors on the lower right there. And this doesn't even include, if you see on the bottom there, biosimilars, generics, and other things for MS. So there are many, many different choices and how we use them and when we use them will be variable in between different people and also even within one person. So as I mentioned, the presently available DMTs really focus on trafficking of these white blood cells, the T cells, the B cells, uh, which are stimulated inside the blood and the lymph nodes and other part of your body, and then will traffic around your body, including going into the nervous system where they may set up shop and they may be amplified further and cause uh, the problems that we see as an acute attack of MS. And all the presently available DMTs are very effective at reducing these types of problems, reducing either the trafficking of the, of the white blood cells or sequestering them or destroying them. And they're very effective, but they're less effective at what we call slow progression independent of relapse activity. And uh, although we, we think that clinically, a lot of the times this is occurring later on in someone's life with MS when they just have slow worsening independent of relapses. In fact, this is true even very early on. It's just more prominent later on. But ultimately, what this really revolves around is using a risk benefit analysis at the various times in someone's life to come up with the best choice for them at that point in time 
hopefully with a lot of benefit and the least amount of risk, or at least balancing the risk and the benefit. And we have, in a broad sense, two broad categories in terms of how effective the drugs are. And we can sort of lump them into moderately effective uh, choices, uh, as listed there, the old injectable medicines and some of the oral medications, as well as the more highly effective therapies. And uh, more highly effective therapies can be broken down in sort of a sense of those that are not highlighted here as more persistently being used. And then also highlighted in yellow would be those that we might use in sort of an, what we call an induction approach. And I'll, I'll have a description of that in a moment. So bear with me while I get to that. So one of the things we, uh, that's on the list to discuss today is escalation. Uh, and we can use this in, in two broad senses. Uh, one, would we start with a moderately effective therapy and then escalate as needed? But then also, how do we escalate if someone is having more problems and or switch to an alternative? And for many years, because of the way the drugs developed, we only really had moderately effective therapies. And in fact, people would sort of go through those, the old Avonex, beta serine, Copaxin, and Rebifs. And then as we got more highly effective therapies, such as Tysabri and Gelenia, uh, it was a natural thing if you had already tried the other drugs and you were having still more difficulties or not tolerating them to transition to the more highly effective therapies. And so in part, this concept that you would use a more moderately effective therapy first and then go to more highly effective therapy just simply represents the way the drugs got developed. And so uh, uh, the important thing in today's world when someone is newly diagnosed is that a lot of times insurance companies will have what they call step edits or fail first therapy approaches where they will pay for drug A, B, or C before they will pay for drug X, Y, or Z. And these are made on, on financial decisions. These are not medical decisions. These are financial decisions. And so we, we fight our way through these because we don't necessarily agree with this concept of using a step edit. But the important point about escalation therapy is that it assumes that many people will respond and tolerate the moderately effective therapies. Unfortunately, that is just simply not the case. So uh, for, uh, for us, using this con uh, concept of escalation therapy is not really the way we think about things. But the basic principles about when you would escalate and when you would uh, change medications, uh, you, you think that we'd have maybe a, a sort of agreed upon formula or algorithm, but in fact, there's really no agreed upon definition of what is drug failure, uh, at least due to second, uh, secondary to lack of effectiveness or efficacy. But if we know that in newly treated patients, if you take someone newly diagnosed, they go on medication X, uh, a number of studies have looked at whether or not you can predict after one year, with whatever has happened within one year, what people might look like five or 10 years later. And we do this in large databases, primarily from Europe, where they start people on drug X, they follow them over a course of a year, and then they follow them further a long time into this database. And you come back and you can mine that database and say, hey, what happened to people if this happened in the first year, if that happened in the first year, or if nothing happened in the first year? And from this kind of uh, data, we know that uh, things that are bad for disability later, five to 10 years later, are a relapse in the first year, three or more new lesions on your brain scan or an active lesion in the first year, accumulation of significant new disability in the first year predicts more disability later. But interestingly, one to two new brain MRI lesions is really not terribly predictive of significant new disease activity. So uh, that's not to say that we would ignore having a new lesion on your scan if you're, you know, if you're one year on medication, but we certainly wouldn't necessarily call that a failure. But if a drug fails due to significant new disease activity, then moving to a higher efficacy drug class makes the most sense. There are now numerous studies that show if you sort of go laterally, and then we did this all the time, you know, 25 years ago, if you failed Avonex, you would go to Rebif. That's not a very logical thing in today's world, but that's what we had available 25 years ago. If a drug fails due to side effects, then switching to a different class would make sense. So for example, if you fail Gelenia uh, due to having a problem with some side effect, changing to, say, Zaposia or Ponvori would not make much sense. You're likely to have the same side effects. But if it's also true that drug can fail due to future risk, 
And in that case, for example, if you have a JC virus test that is negative, the JC virus is associated with this development of the brain infection PML, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, which some of our drugs are associated with, especially tisobrine. You may be negative on that test and have no risk, but then you convert, that is, you're exposed to the virus, and that will force you to change your medication, so a switch. Or perhaps if you're on one of the CD20 drugs, such as Ocaris or Rituximab, and you're having a drop in your normal antibodies or your immunoglobulins, those are things that might uh, be associated with future risk of infection or reactivation of infection, and that would... Uh, uh, suggest that you might change or alter your medication at that point in time. That's not really an escalation. That's really a switch. And oftentimes you would switch to a drug that it has a similar level of efficacy. So we can use escalation. We still do use escalation. Uh, but the, the real issue is, would you use a high efficacy therapy first? And the principle of using a high efficacy therapy first is that many people will in fact fail or not tolerate the moderately effective therapies. There's the greatest need for highly effective therapies early because that's when people have most of these relapses and changes on their scan for which these drugs are best suited. Um, the lowest risk of the of highly effective therapy is in younger patients. That is, younger patients tolerate everything better than older patients with regard to potential risks or side effects. And it simply just doesn't make sense to let someone accumulate more disability when you have a known more effective drugs. And these drugs have all been tested in head-to-head -head battles, and there's clearly differences between them, it just doesn't make sense to say, well, let's, let's have you get more disabled, then we'll give you the better stuff. That is just not logical. So the question for us really revolves around, would you use an induction approach, which I'm going to describe in a moment, or would you use a more persistently highly effective therapy? And so what is induction therapy? This is a term that's borrowed from the cancer literature. And uh, in their world, it's a typically first therapy. It's for a restricted period of time. And it's often bundled with other things such as surgery. Like if you have a lung cancer or breast cancer, you might do uh, some induction therapy, you might then do surgery, you might then do x-ray therapy, and might even do hormonal therapy. In our world, uh, what we're looking for is something that would potentially be used as a first line agent or very early, and then would be giving you long lasting benefits so that you wouldn't have to use it for a prolonged period of time. And you would potentially have even permanent alterations in some parts of your immune system that would allow you to not have to be retreated or be retreated very in, uh, infrequently. It's also sort of uh, taken together with the fact that risks may be untenable if you use these persistently. And so perhaps the best example is that is with uh, Novantron, Novantron or Mitoxantron, which was really not used much uh, at all, if at all, anywhere in the world right now. It, you can only use it for a certain number of doses and a certain amount of the drug because it would be associated potentially with heart failure. Up to 3% of people would have heart failure if you exceeded what our limit was. And uh, also delayed leukemia years later. And so uh, uh, you couldn't go over that dose because it was known to be associated with that. But in addition... There's sort of this false idea that if you use an induction agent, that somehow magically you don't ever need to be retreated. The reality is, is that all the induction therapies that are presently available, in fact, are associated with some level of retreatment. And then the question is, do they really uh, just be sort of something we, we'd use early, uh, but we wouldn't be able to use persistently because of potential risks? And so these are medications that could be considered uh, induction uh, therapies. Cladrine, Lampetrata, Novantron, and then even uh, a stem cell therapy, autologous hematopoietic stem cell therapy, which you're going to hear about in the next talk with Dr. Uh, Dr. Piquet, and I'm not going to really talk about. Uh, all of these could be considered therapies that would be used on a short-term basis, stem cell therapy really perhaps once, uh, and would potentially give long-lasting benefits that would not require more persistent use. In general, the risks are relatively high here, especially compared to the moderately effective therapies. Uh, the exception for that is cladrine, where the risks are not really that high. Um, and all have some degree of failure, and that's the important part. Uh, for example, it could be up to, uh, up to 5% or more per year with cladrine, for example, in long-term studies. So although we think of these as potentially induction therapies that would maybe alter things permanently, you wouldn't need to be treated for a long period of time, the reality is that there's still significant retreatment issues. So in practice, given the variability of disease severity and the difficulty with that prediction when first treatment decisions are being made, 
really only cladribine is presently being used in this sense as a potential induction agent. And again, there is treatment failure with this. So uh, it doesn't, it, none of these really give us the long acting benefit uh, in that sense that we would like to, although we'll hear what Dr. Piquet says about stem cell therapy. So our view right now is that highly effective therapy used persistently uh, makes most sense for most newly diagnosed patients with MS. Usually this means either Tysabri or one of the anti-CD20 agents, maybe uh, some of the uh, uh, medications, the same class as Jelani and Symposia, um, and, uh, and then to adjust as needed over time. And that adjustment over time uh, could mean, especially since this is a chronic condition where people may use these medicines for years and the risks and benefits may change over time, it may mean perhaps de-escalating the medication to reduce risk and may even mean discontinuation, the ultimate de-escalation over time. And that's because as people change, as people get older, the risk of relapses diminishes, the benefits that are seen with these medications diminish, uh, and the risks are potentially higher for some drugs, especially the CD20 drugs, in terms of seriousness, seriousness and number of infections, perhaps malignancies, and also uh, alterations in vaccine response. So you could potentially de-escalate as these risks are going higher several different ways. You could go to a different class of medication that perhaps has lower risks or a different set of risks that are more tolerated. You could do, go to a lower dose. And when we started with the use of rituximab many years ago, rituxan, we used a much higher dose, 75% reduction since that beginning. We usually started 2,000 milligrams every six months. We're down now to 500 milligrams uh, every six months or even every 12 months. Um, and that lower frequency is another way you do that by extending the dosing interval. It's been proven now uh, for uh, Tysabri, for example, that you can have extended dosing out to six weeks or perhaps even longer in some people. And we also are typically using Ocovis rituximab uh, both uh, in longer extended dosing intervals up to 12 months or even perhaps longer. And then again, the ultimate de-escalation would be discontinuation. So the question then is, you know, what's, what's the potential benefit and what the potential risks with de-escalation as well? So one of the logics for why you might want to consider de-escalation over time is that the higher uh, potential risk associated with some of the medicines may not get you more bang for the buck. And this is from our own data with over 2,000 people that were treated in, in two classes. Uh, uh, and this is just out of our database. And uh, a significant number of these patients, about um, 1,500 or so, uh, were on either uh, Gelenia or on Tecfidera, two oral drugs considered sort of um, uh, medium level, if you will, uh, level of therapy efficacy versus people who are using either rituximab or Tysabri. And if you look at people who were followed for two years in our database and ask the question, did they have a new relapse or a new scan change? Um, you know, uh, we would count that as an outcome. And you can see in this, in this uh, uh, graph on the left here that the likelihood of having a new relapse or a scan change is dependent upon age. And we've known this for uh, many, many years. So if you start drugs, say when you're 20, you have a risk overall with any of these drugs of roughly you know, about a 40% chance over two years of having a new scan change or a relapse. But as you get older, when you start these medications, that risk goes substantially down. But importantly, on the graph on the right, you can see that it depends on what drug you're talking about. So on the top, is the people who were using either Gelenia or Tecfidera. And you can see the solid red line goes down like this uh, over this time and gets less and less. But what if they started with the more highly effective therapy, either rituximab or Tysabri? You can see they had a much lower likelihood of having new disease activity, and that went down over time. But at some point, and the dotted lines are the error bars, the 95% confidence limit, at some point, and it's around age 53 or 54, the two, the two cross, the curves cross. And so whatever benefit that was achieved in younger patient that was greater with rituximab or with Tysabri compared to the oral drugs is diminished. So all you're really getting potentially is potentially higher risk, uh, but no greater benefit. 
And so that would be part of a logic for why you would de-escalate if in fact those risks were higher. And we know that the risks primarily uh, are revolved around infection. And this is from a Swedish study. These are newly diagnosed patients so they are much younger, uh, but you can see that there's a difference. These are a number of people who've had a serious infection. And over time, people have accumulated a number of people have had serious infections. And uh, they use rituximab, not ocalizumab in Sweden because it's substantially cheaper. And um, uh, you can see that this class of drugs has the highest rate of serious infection, uh, Jeleni in that class below that, then Tysabri, and then the injectable therapies compared to people who do not have uh, multiple sclerosis. So there are differences between the drugs in terms of what the risk is with regard to infection. This is from our own study uh, with our colleagues at NYU looking at 1,000 patients on rituximab. And it's, so it's not just age or, uh, uh, or not even just the drug that would matter, but it also is some uh, other portions of just the individual that may matter as well. Uh, and so in our study, looking again at serious infections with people on rituximab, things that in a multivariate analysis matter, well, actually age didn't matter that much, but men had more infections than women. And at the bottom here, if you had used rituximab longer per year, it's about a third increased risk of having uh, an infection with every year longer that you used it. But the most important was for people who were disabled, an almost ninefold increased risk if you're wheelchair bound compared to walking independently. So there are factors related to the individual that play a role in these uh, decisions when you're talking about risk of infection. Uh, this is from a, a large study looking at age-related uh, adverse events revolving around infections and malignancies uh, published a few years ago and showed uh, shows that uh, as you age, the risk of infection compared to people, the, this is in placebo-controlled trials, the risk overall of infection uh, 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 over, I'm sorry, the risk of malignancy as you age uh, goes up and uh, is greater than you would see within the placebo group. Overall, there's really no increased risk in malignancy, but as people age, perhaps, there's a small increased risk of having malignancy. And that is with the depletive agents and when we say depletive agents, we're referring to CD20 drugs like Ocarus and Rituximab, Casimta, and Briondi. So that's on the risk side. If you um, have continued use of these medications, things that would be potentially more of an issue as you age and use the drug for a longer period of time. But is it safe from the point of view of risk of disease activity recurring if, in fact, you de-escalate? And so I'll show a couple slides about de-escalating over time. This is from the Ocrelizumab or Ocrevis phase two trial where there was an extension. People were treated for 18 months, either three or four cycles uh, of, uh, of the Ocrevis uh, over that time. And then they were followed uh, for uh, out to about 120 to 144 weeks, uh, looking at different outcomes in terms of how well it worked and also what the risks were. And as you can see in the top right here, the blue is the Ocrevus treated patients. And even though they got their last treatment at week 72, uh, from weeks 96 to 144, or from weeks 120 to 144, there's no change, there's no rebound, there's no return of disease activity when you count relapses. And you can also see that there is literally no new enhancing lesions or active lesions on scan from week 96 to 144. So, God, five minutes already? Okay. Um, so um, we can see similar kinds of things with rituximab, uh, and this is again from Sweden, where they extend the dosing interval out, and there's no increased risk of having new disease activity there. And the benefits are also that there are less new reactions in terms of infections, either serious adverse events or serious or serious uh, or just any infection for people when they are treated compared to when they were not treated. So what about DMT discontinuation, the ultimate de-escalation? It's the same logic as for escalation, uh, for de-escalation. Uh, older patients, longer time since new disease activity and lack of new MRI cha changes at the time of discontinuing. And this is best seen in this uh, study from Switzerland where they looked at those factors individually and came up with a scoring system where six would be very high and perhaps high risk of reactivation and zero would be very low. And that's in fact exactly what they showed 
that if you were younger, if you had recent disease activity, and if you had recent MRI scan changes, all of those were the ones like in red here, this is in uh, first Innsbruck and then in Vienna where you can see that there is substantial new disease risk activity over that period of time. So that prompted us to do the DISCO, uh, information like that prompted us to do the DISCO MS study and uh, this is what we looked at. This is a randomized controlled discontinuation trial. Many of you have seen this data already. Uh, it was published last year. Uh, mean age was 63, had to be at least 55. Uh, and you had to be um, uh, on drug for at least five years and with no relapse for at least five years. In fact, people were on drug for quite a few years and their last relapse was 14 years ago on average, 13.9 years. And most of the patients had relapsing MS. And what we were able to show was that we could not show that it was not inferior. I know that's a lot of double negatives, but we could not show it was not inferior to go off drug because there was a little bit more activity in the discontinued group compared to the continued group. But there were very few relapses. It was non-inferior. This is significant, non-inferior in regard to relapse, but there was an increased risk perhaps of uh, new disease activity by scan. And most of this was just one or two new dots on the scan um, and as I mentioned before, that's not known to be associated with substantial risk of new disease activity. So we did a, a, an extension as well in a subset of people and showed no new relapses and no new and minimal new scan changes uh, in the uh, population of people that were extended now out to 40 months as opposed to two years. And uh, that just is as seen down here, no relapses uh, and only three people total out of 74 had new disease activity on scan. There's also another study that's a randomized controlled trial. These accepted people from 18 and older, those is dot MS in Amsterdam. And they looked at people with no significant inflammatory activity over five years, which means no relapse, but they could have had some degree of MRI activity, much more than we would have allowed in our study. And the, but they also did look at clinical relapses and or new significant MRI activity, which they counted as three or more lesions. We counted just one lesion. Uh, or two active lesions, contrast enhancing lesions. And they had a much younger age population, not surprisingly, nine years younger, mostly relapsing MS. They use only what they call first line agents, so none of the more highly effective therapies. And they showed uh, only with about 15 months of follow up, they showed that there was much more activity and they counted significant activity first. Uh, and it was zero in the continuation group, uh, but eight people either had a relapse or a significant new MRI activity. So there's nine people here because one person had both. But when you compare any activity, which is really the same thing comparing apples to apples for the DISCO study, you can see the DISCO study on the right, they had twice as many people that had new disease activity, either a relapse or any scan change, reflecting the fact that they accepted people with much more potential radiologic activity into the study, and also they were nine years younger on average. And this is a study that, again, gets to the point that not all the drugs are the same. This was just published last week, comes from our colleagues in France. And if you look only at the right, they looked at more highly effective ther therapies, and this was an observational trial, not a randomized control trial. And the importance of that is that in both the DOT-MS study and in the DISCO MS study, we really mostly had, almost exclusively had, either just the injectable drugs or some of the oral agents, but not a lot of highly effective therapies. So they looked at highly effective therapies in their large database that they have here. And they had 154 people that were matched in each group, either to discontinue or to continue therapy. And they just looked at them in the database. And they asked the question, they had to be at least 50 years of age and have no new relapse activity or scan change activity for two years, so a short period of time. And they asked the same question, what's the likelihood of having a relapse or having uh, a change in disability? And they had patients who were average age of 57, again, younger than DISCO, but importantly, they were more disabled than our patients were in DISCO. Uh, they had failed, 35% had failed three or more drugs. Um, and in addition, the last time since relapse or new scan activity was just a little over four years. So they had more active patients with more disability. And in France, they only get on the more highly effective therapies after they have failed the other drugs. So that is just the way their national health system is set up. So 100% of these people had to have failed at least one. Um, and what they showed was, if you look at all three, Jelenia, 
rituximab or tisabri compared to staying on drug, going off drug, was worse with regard to relapse seen here. But it was really notably worse for tisabri and gelenia, both of which are associated with significant relapse of disease activity. We know when you go off. Interesting, it was not seen with the CD20 drugs, in this case, rituximab. When they looked at progression of disability, showed the same thing with the other two drugs, Jeleni and Tysabri, significant increased risk, but not with rituximab. So the conclusions are how and when we use disease-modifying therapies is gonna vary over the lifetime of the patient and choices keep evolving. And it's all gonna be about the risk-benefit ratios and that's gonna drive your decision-making at different times throughout the course of your time with MS. The patient choices are gonna represent many different factors, including concerns of their own, their loved ones, and their physicians. And our best suggestions today are to use a highly effective therapy persistently at the outset to potentially consider de-escalation and discontinuation over time as those risk and benefit changes, but importantly to recognize that the risk of having new disease activity never goes to zero. So when we start using a therapy, we should always have this in our mind, begin nothing until you have considered how you're gonna stop using that over time. Thank you for your attention.